Well, now that you've uh, looked at the first lecture video for this week, I'm going to give you some advice on how to look at um, something and go through it to extract what's important that contains and anything that's worth mentioning about it. I'm going to um, go first of all into the instructions that you've got for what to do when reading the 25 articles. Now you should already have done, gone through these seven steps and prepared a note about either article one or article three. I'm not going to talk about them here, leave that for the workshop. Now we're down at the bottom. It says um, it would be sensible to also prepare notes for the five chapters of the book. Now you don't have to prepare those notes, but in preparing the notes, you're thinking carefully about what it is that the thing you're reading is telling you. And as soon as you start doing that, you begin to see things that you didn't notice when you just skim read it. If you read something very uh, casually, like you would read a novel or a newspaper or a blog or a tweet, you don't concentrate your mind on what this thing is and how it works and how it fits together and how the first sentence connects to the second. But as soon as you start taking notes, as soon as you start summarizing, as soon as you start trying to identify specific things, you begin to have a deeper understanding of the thing you're looking at. So for example, when I was a student, I took uh, for the average lecture, one hour lecture, which was 50 minutes, I would have three pages of handwritten notes, which you're talking about maybe a um, hundred lines of handwriting. So let's say there was um, 12 words a line. So we get 1,200 words. I do that for all my classes. And at the end of each day, I went into a spare classroom, the one where there was no one else. And I used to sit down and I would make notes from my handwritten notes. In other words, I'd organize what I'd written. Um, I'd create bullet point lists um, and you know, if I'd scribbled down a, a drawing or a diagram, I would make a better copy of it, version of it, and put that in. Because by doing it that same day, I still remembered what I'd seen and also remembered what was being said, which meant that where my notes weren't complete because maybe I hadn't been able to keep up, I could still remember the points that were made and add those to my notes. And that's effectively what you're going to be doing. And I'm going to move out of there for a minute. And um, I want to show you a different thing, which is to do with the, well, it's about the book, isn't it? The book that we're going to be using on the course. And I really want to just um, talk you through the things you do when you um, open up the book. So you open up the book, and what do you see? Right, so I want to go through this. This is the Arnold book. Now, I'm not allowed to distribute electronic copy um, for copyright reasons. Here's the contents. So you see, it's quite a short book. The whole thing is basically over by the time you get to um, 
146 pages. And for this week, whoops, you're expected to have had a look at this lot. The book, however, begins with a preface. And as in articles, when you should read the abstract in books, you should read the preface. There's not much in this one. It just says what was changed between the two editions. But the first edition preface, which this is, sets out how the book's constructed. So what I did was I went through it and I highlighted the key points that was in the preface, that were in the preface. So you see, I, I, first of all, you got summary. This is what uh, the book is about. Uh, what each chapter is about. What each chapter focuses on a different aspect. And then you get the detail about what each of the chapters are. Now you'd expect that in an article too. You'd expect uh, an overview of what the paper's about. You expect a summary of what each of the sections are doing or of the literature. Then you'd expect some sort of description of what's coming. It doesn't happen in all cases. And in fact, in history papers, as you'll find out, sometimes is not there at all. You don't get a summary of what's coming, but you do get an introduction that summarizes it without being specific about when the detail is going to appear in the article. And then it gives you chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. These are the main chapters in the book. So you get told what chapter one's about. So when you're reading chapter one, before you read it, if you read this, it tells you what you're going to be reading about. Same with chapter two, same with chapter three. And when you look at the chapters themselves, you might find it quite difficult to arrive at these short statements. So here you are, they're given to you. In an article, when at the end of the introduction, the author has written the next chapter, this, the next section looks at this, it's the equivalent. So it gives you some, uh, uh, it's like if you're hanging coats in a wardrobe or clothes in a wardrobe, you go to a coat hanger, this is your coat hanger. The final chapter is a very short chapter. And it talks about how you, or what you, what the benefits are of doing, in this case, medieval history, but history in general. Now, the, the book is all about medieval history. So you might wonder why, why am I reading a book about what is medieval history when I'm doing a course that's about history? basically from 476 to 2122 or 2022. It's all to do with the core focus of the course, which is history. And the problems of doing historical research in the Middle Ages, medieval history, are not solely problems for that period. They're problems for all history. Medieval history has a lot more, a lot clearer examples. So by reading a book that's telling you, you know, basically how to do medieval history or how to understand it, how to, how to interpret it, you're, being t you're actually being told how to, how to do that with any historical piece. So for example, if you were to be set a project to write a 1500 word essay on the creation uh, and performance of the IASB, that's a historical essay. And you would find that you would have sources that are saying contradictory things and you need to work out, oh, which one do I use? You'll have very informed sources that are telling you what really happened and you've got people who know a little 
who don't have the full picture and their conclusions and their descriptions are, are just enough different from the other one, the one that does know what they're doing, to cause confusion. And what you have to do in a historical study is decide which of those pieces of evidence you should use. What you find um, if you were to, to read beyond what's in the course, you begin to come across situations where the authors have taken the easy option. Instead of using the perfect source, the one that actually does know what happened, but which is 700 pages long. These authors have used the summary of the summary of the summary, a very diluted version of the topic. And as a result, there's not very much depth of understanding of the real issues. There might be a lot of understanding of some minor issues or some vaguely accurate, but not precisely accurate issues. And accounting history, what's been written about it, is very much of that type. Now, it all came about in the early 20th century when a group of Italian accounting historians basically began the discipline. Accounting history dates back effectively into the, the last quarter of the 19th century, so that's about 1870 onwards. But if the real founding work was done between 1910 and 1920, and what those people did was they saw all this evidence in archives, that's just libraries of old books. And they, they, they knew how to read it, which in itself is a challenge, but they knew how to. So they took the effort to learn how to read what they were reading. They were looking at, and they were looking at all these account books um, from, 14th century, approximately, from 1300 onwards. And they could see what was being done, what the, they could see how the accounts were being prepared. And by accounts, I do mean the ledger accounts, not any statements. So they could see the bookkeeping. Now, in order to understand what was being done and to explain why it was being done in a certain way. They needed to go and find out about context, about what was going on in the world outside the bookkeeper's desk. What was going on around the bookkeeper? What was the business needing that made these books of account useful? And what external factors were influencing the way that the bookkeeping was done? That's what they should have done. They should have investigated that, but they didn't. Even when uh, accounting historians of the first half of the 20th century came across studies which gave them that information as they did, they tended to treat those studies very superficially. For example, uh, the business historian, Raymond de Rover, who was actually an accountant, he was aware of what had been written by German scholars about medieval Italy, a legal framework, and about um, the importance of account books at that time. 
But instead of going into detail and using that information in his own work, when he wrote about it, he just discussed how, how strange it was, but he did this very briefly, how strange it was that a school teacher had written a, an 800 page book looking at these issues, but none of the real academics have done so. And then he moved on, he ignored it. And that's really what you've got in the kind of history literature for the period up to 1500. You've got superficial use of context, superficial use of other literature, and just vague descriptions, or very really precise descriptions in many cases of, of what the account books are looking like. And those researchers decided that, well, we can't actually understand what's going on. We're going to set ourselves a target. And the target they set themselves was to identify real examples of double entry bookkeeping because they saw that as a point at which accounting was born, modern accounting. Now, in order to find out if you're looking at uh, an account book containing entries made using double entry bookkeeping, you need to know what double entry bookkeeping is. So they defined it. And they didn't define it on the basis of in each transaction, there's an item exchange in a form of settlement, and one is entered as debit and the other is a credit. And each entry indicates where the contra entry is to be found. The contra entry of a debit entry is a credit entry, and the contra entry of the credit entry is a debit entry. No, they didn't do that. What they decided was, well, look at what would happen once you have entries in a ledger in double entry. And to them, the obvious thing that would happen is that you'd get financial statements prepared. And to do that, you need to close the ledger. And in closing the ledger, you need to balance it so that, and transfer the, the, um, the expenses and the income balances on the accounts relating to those, transfer those somewhere so that you can put an entry summarizing what had occurred profit-wise into your capital account. And to do that, you needed a profit loss account or an income statement. So they decided they would define double entry based on what happens at the end of that process, which is that there are changes in capital. And he said, if your bookkeeping system reveals or shows the movements in capital over a period and if these other conditions are satisfied as well, then it's double entry. And if it doesn't show the movements in capital, it's not double entry. In other words, if you haven't closed your ledger, it can't be double entry. That's effectively what it was. Of course, there's exceptions to that, but the way they set it up, you basically had to close your ledger. So accounting history went down a blind alley. Now, had they had this book, they may have been able to appreciate that they were doing the wrong things. So when I was going through this first chapter, or going to the first chapter, the first thing I noticed was, well, here's some extra information. That's quite interesting. And you see it's a map of Europe for 900. And it's of course split in a half because it's across two pages. And then you get the same map, but it's 460 years later. Just showing the changes that are taking place in that time. And you can see the key down here showing you who's in charge of everything. And these, this key has changed. So there, were, there was quite a lot of change took place over that period. And here you get to chapter one. 
Now, at this point, what you should be thinking to yourself is, right, I've got to read this. In this case, it's not terribly long. It's about 20 pages, and they are quite short pages. It was quite a small book. I mean, uh, as you can see, it's, it's only that big. It's not big. And you look at this and you think, right, okay, this is, um, let's treat this as a story. So you're just going to read it like you'd read anything, a novel or a piece of fiction, whatever. And sure enough, it's what you get. And it opens as a story would, a medieval tale. Um, the first time Bartolomeu, Bartolomeu, the priest, talked to them, was on 9th of February, 1320. Papal Palace Avignon. And his interrogation took up most of one day. Now, if you, if you knew much about um, the history of Europe from maybe uh, 1200 to 1800, you'd have heard about the sort of things that are described next. Anyway, you get the tale about this. You get told all about it. You read through it. Um, and look, you come to statements like this, and he was tortured. He was a priest. But Bartholomew did not confess. And you begin to wonder yourself, what on earth is going on here? Is this um, necessary? Well, it's all part of the story. And these people all existed. You see what he says here? At first sight, this is what one might call a very medieval tale. It's got all the stereotypes. Tyrant, a pope, torture, magic. Um, and you can build up this picture in your mind that is quite uh, vivid of what had happened. The author talks about um, some films, some of which you'll have seen. And you know, it's, it's just talking about this description and giving you some modern things that might help you to link it so you understand it as much as possible. And then he says, okay, but hang on a minute. There's more to this than meets the eye. And in other words, think more carefully about what you've just read. What's it really telling you? And he talks about some of the things that we assume about the Middle Ages. Um, you know, it's, it's this bit here. Everyone knows the Middle Ages was a superstitious age. And this is to do with the magic. But the magic in this story is located not where you'd expect it. But in serious books. And then he tells you, well, that's not actually unusual. So you've gone from the stereotype to having pointed out to you that there's something in this story that doesn't quite resonate with the stereotype. And then it's not unusual. And how does he know it's not unusual? Because he's looked at the context. He's looked around the story. He's looked at what was going on around this Inquisition and the rest of that story. 
And it's by doing that, by looking around, that you begin to find more understanding develops. You develop your understanding of what you're looking at by looking at what's going on around it. Now he tells us a bit more. Things were never quite what we expect today because we've got a very um, superficial um, perspective on what these sort of things were at that period, fueled by what we've seen in films and on television and read in books. The Inquisition uh, was not a particularly pleasant time for those that were the, the victims of it. Um, and they said, well, actually, there was not really such a thing as the Inquisition, except under Spain. And it's quite often referred to as the Spanish Inquisition. But you know, the word itself, inquisition, is what people latch on to. Further on, he talks about the church, that's the Roman Catholic Church, being a complex, in some ways, widely heterogeneous edifice. And here we get an explanation of the procedures that are used when interrogating Bartolomeo. They were inquisitorial in the sense of being a legal technique. And the people that were questioning them could be described as inquisitors. Torture was involved. And then he says, but well, actually that was permitted. It was the secular authorities in Milan that tortured Bartolomeo. Secular is uh, something that's not linked to, directly to religion. It's neutral. And here you get the punchline. Bartolomeo's tale is not a story about magic. It's really about politics and communication. And that is the point. You've read a story historical story, a factual story, and you're trying to understand what it's really about. So you've looked at context, the surrounding context, you looked at the things going on and you said to yourself, well, he's being tortured. Was that normal? Was it usual? Um, they wanted a magic formula, but was that, does that make sense? Is that not just nonsense? It's really about politics and communication. And if you read carefully through this, you begin to see the point. Um, and he talk goes on to communication down here, for example. One thing that he does reveal is the level of literacy, literacy in the population. Most people assume that, that people did not become literate uh, until relatively recently. But there were high degrees of literacy in the more advanced centres, population centres of particularly Italy, um, in this period that the tale is about, 14th century. And he get trade routes linked together, various European centers connected Europe to the Middle East. Letters, reports, recorded interrogations, archives, sermons, songs, stories and images all circulated across European kingdoms. With postal services in the, in the 13th century, and most certainly also um, in the 12th. So information did travel, but didn't travel as quickly as obviously it does today. It would take several days for um, a letter to go from Siena to um, Champagne, Siena and 
middle of Italy up to Champagne, which is the northeast of France. It takes several days for that to, letter to arrive, but they did send them. And people knew what was going on in other places. It wasn't a world where everyone just stayed in their village and didn't, didn't go more than uh, 10 miles outside the village in their entire life. There was a lot more awareness of the outside world. And he talks about the language and all this material is, is important for you. Um, and this point in red, if one scratches the surface of the medieval, something more complex appears. Things are not quite as they initially seem. And that's the big message for you to get. Every element of medievalness is situated within a certain perspective, differing between different times, places, and people. In other words, if you're looking at the 14th century Aberdeen, what you see there is going to be different from what you see in 14th century Edinburgh, 14th century Belfast. 14th century London, Paris, Rome, Frankfurt, Lisbon, Madrid. Every place, every location was different. There was not one universal and univocal feature of the period. Everyone didn't speak with the same voice. It was, every place was unique because the context was unique, uniquely different. And here you get um, information about how certain things came to pass, how we arrived at um, the periods we use when we describe history. You get all sorts of little bits of information that if you put them together will help you to understand what is going on when you read the accounting history articles that you have to read in this course. This part here talks about the Holy Roman Emperor and the Catholic Church. She's actually very central to medieval accounting history. There's a lot in this 20 pages that helps you, will help you to understand what you're reading. To understand, help you to understand why people approach your history in certain ways. It'll, it'll justify for you some of the approaches adopted in what you read. And it'll also help you to understand, to some extent, why if two people write the history of an event, like a battle, or the Wall Street crash, or the credit crisis of 2008, Two different people write an account of that. There won't be anything like the same. We'll have used different bits of information, different research approaches, and their interpretation will be very personal. They will place more emphasis on some things and less emphasis on others compared to other people. It's the same in accounting. If you give two accountants a ledger that has been closed and you say to them, prepare an income state and a balance sheet, they will have two different figures for the net profit. They will have different asset values in the balance sheet. One might make the 
the business look very successful, the other might make it look like it's struggling. We're using the same data, but the way they use it is different. And it's the same with anyone writing about history. The, the description you get is personal. So different people see it different ways. And for this reason in the history literature, accounting history literature, you'll see conflicting views. You'll be able to see um, opinions were strongly in favor of one view and against another. And you'll see why the second version, although not accepted by the majority, made sense. And you'll also see why the first version, which was accepted by the majority, made sense. They both make sense. But the opinions of the historians, if you like, are towards one version rather than the other. Now, what happens then is that over time, the dominant opinion wins. It may have been the wrong opinion. It may be flawed by something that no one was aware of. And someone 20, 30, 40, 50 years later discovers something about the surrounding context that demonstrates emphatically that the, that dominant opinion was wrong. It may also demonstrate that the other opinion was wrong, but on the other hand, it might demonstrate the other opinion was actually right. And at that point, it's very difficult, if a lot of time has passed, to impose a different opinion on a literature that is dominated by one voice. So when you're reading accounting history, what people have written about it, you need to keep a very open mind and not be sucked in by dominant perspectives, but take everything at face value and just consider it. Is this or is this not useful? Is it logical? Does it make sense? And by reading through this book, you get a lot of clues as to the sort of things that you need to look at. You'll see in here, you've got a description about how a particular school of thought came about the way people do their history came about. You don't have to know that off by heart, but just being aware that something like that had happened gives you some perspective on how some historians approach what they do. It doesn't take a terrible amount of time to read through this 20 pages. But if you want to benefit really from doing it, you have to take notes. I effectively took my notes by highlighting pages in the text. And I do this with the, the, the work I read. Anything I think is going to be important to me, I make an electronic copy of it. And I do exactly what you're saying here. I highlight things. Sometimes I highlight a lot of things. Sometimes I don't. In this case, I just wanted to make sure that I had picked out a lot of the key issues that had been discussed in the chapter. And there are a lot of them. Now you see here, he's, he's finished his, his, basically his introduction to his, this chapter. And he's saying that there are four problems of which any student of medieval history should be aware that's any student of history. And he's got an overarching uh, issue. And he goes through them. Now they're not they're not they're not laid out as a series of bullet points. So you have to focus when you're reading it in order to note when he moves from one to the other. Nationalism. Nationalism Im impacts how history is done and interpreted. Um, there's a there was a a Belgian uh, accounting historian, Henri Perrini, active in the first half of the 20th century, 1930 to, let's say, 60, who um, did a lot of research into the medieval period, in trade in the medieval period. And in his view, um, Bruges or Brugge 
was a very important um, trading center. That's since been disputed. And the, the, the people that dispute it say, well, look, he was biased. That's where he came from. You see that in accounting history as well. There's um, a lot of, there's not a lot, but there is some prominent criticism of the early accounting historians who dominated the field, people like Fabio Besta, uh, dominated the field as being biased because they wanted something to be identified as the source. Uh, they wanted a region to be identified as the source, um, the place where double entry bookkeeping was first used. So this concept of nationalism is uh, important. Then you get the second one here. The study of the Middle Ages continues to be framed by attitudes, interests, and concepts of the 19th century. You get the idea of nation again. And in this case, he focuses on that. And in Italy is central to this course. It's where double entry bookkeeping was invented. Uh, it's where modern accounting was invented. And it's, we think of it as a country. And you look at, in your head, you've got Italy, uh, the, the country with a, it's a, a boot, the shape of a boot. It wasn't a country. It wasn't a unified country until the 1860s. And it was just, it was a collection of, um, of city states in the, in the 13th, 14th, 15th century. Before all that, it was part of the Holy Roman Empire. The North was part of the Holy Roman Empire. But then you had the papal states and you had um, parts of it that were not. It wasn't a country, but we talk about it as if it is. And the kind of history literature doesn't really recognize that. It thinks about it as being all one big place. And that stems from the 19th century when the early accounting historians started doing their job, doing their work. They did, they did notice that things happened in certain parts of the country, but they treat this one country, but it wasn't. They fought, they fought each other, as you'll be finding out next week, uh, in some very nasty battles. So you need to think about nations. This point here, Anglophone, that's the English language. Uh, it's had a particular trait of Victorian scholarship where you clean things, you sanitize things, uh, things you don't want to talk about. Interestingly, that this has uh, come back uh, in, in spades with the attitude today about slavery. But it's a popular movement, which effectively is trying to rewrite the history books, sweep out the things that appear to be vulgar from our past. And this happens throughout history, that as generations pass, the history books get rewritten, and the things we don't really want to talk about get forgotten. Anyway, go down with that. Third problem is different. The periodization of history. We use a periodization in history uh, that resonates with, with Italy, if you like. But Europe wasn't one big place. It wasn't a unified place, like I said earlier. Aberdeen in the, in the 14th century was different from Edinburgh. So why, how, can you, how can you divide history into specific periods? 
and you argue that those periods are based on, on the way society was organized, when society in one part of Europe was different from another. That's the point he's making there. And you got a comment here about the way that historians work and so on. Fourth problem is whether it was the Middle Ages at all. Is it something that was just invented? Did it really happen? It's looked as you've got the, the, the Roman Empire, which was a, a high level of sophistication, a high level of sophistication organization. When it ended, the, the general perception is that the world came to an end, that Europe went into a black hole, that um, it took a long time to come out of, and that's the Middle Ages. Started with the Dark Ages, and then it slowly became clear. Hey, guys, on a little bit. Towards the end, he, he makes these points here. Where medieval people like us are fundamentally different. And that is very important if you try to understand what people were doing. You've got to place the Middle Ages in a meaningful context. That's what the historian does. The historian chooses the context he's going to use. She's going to use. And a final conclusion. History is political. It's a balancing act. You've got to come down on one side or the other. So that's the... That's the, the book. That's how I would go through the, the, the each chapter of the book. Now, some of the chapters are longer than some of the others. And obviously, the first chapter is an introduction, and introductory chapters are usually light, easy to follow. But the other chapters are no, are no more dense. They'll take longer to read because they're longer. But if you go through them, writing down the key point, the key things. You build up a picture of what's going on. So I had an electronic version of the, the book there, a PDF, and I was able to highlight each line that I wanted to remember. If I was doing it from the hard copy of the book or, or using an electronic book, that you couldn't, that I couldn't mark up. I just write down um, a series of bullet points. So I'd open up a Word document. I just go like, right. "Oh, there's point one, bullet point one, bullet point two, bullet point three. And every now and again, when a, a topic had finished or a theme had finished, I'd write a very short summary paragraph about it. Uh, the tale of Bartholomew uh, reveals X, Y, Z. It indicates that you should ABC. And I go through that. And the, the 20 pages that, that takes about an average person probably 15 minutes to read because they're very short pages. Um, you might take an hour to write a summary of that. You may or may not have to read twice the text. But the key thing is that you get a summary that picks out what you think are the important points. Now, if you then take your summary and you read it a week later, so you go back to it and you read it, or just two or three days later, but leave it a couple of days, you read through it and you then for example, pick up the Bartholomew part, the first three pages of the book. 
and you read them again. You'll probably find that you'd want to change your notes. You'll have noticed things you didn't notice before. Now, just the final thing I'm going to say, when you're doing your project where you have to take an article and write a report about it, you would be wise to do what you have to do with the 25 articles that uh, we're going to be, you're going to be reading over the next 10 weeks and, and take a seven point summary, prepare a seven point summary of that article. When you're doing that for each week, you'd only read it once. When you're doing it for the project, you'd be wanting to read it uh, as many times as you possibly can, but you'd leave time between each of them. So the first time you take notes, then a, a couple of days later, you'd read through your notes and then you'd read the article again, you'd amend your notes and you'd do it again and again. And maybe over the course of a week, you'd read it four times and you'd change your notes. So then at the end of the week, you've got your your summary as you want it and then you're ready to to actually write up your project or that part of your project the key thing we want you to do is to learn how to think critically how to analyze what you're reading interpret it bring in awareness of other things you've read and see if they help you to understand what you're looking at so don't treat all the articles in this course as separate treat them as a big body of work and what you'll be able to do when you're reading the seventh or the eighth article is to remember what you read in the first, the second, the third, and bring that information in. And that will help you to think, see things like inconsistencies. And the very last article we do on this course is going to be an opportunity for you all to use what you've learned on the course and identify inconsistencies or Ill Ill illogical statements or wrong statements in the article. So that's that's all for now.